to do exactly what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is a joy and a privilege for me, and I know Tom is smiling, um, to see what just a vision has produced. I know that when, um, when the first message and announcement went out seven years ago, I don't think we knew, John and, and Wayne, that it would be this awesome. But God knew. And he knew the country would be in much worse shape today than it was seven years ago. And for that reason, he has called us to Denver together for such a time as this. Let me uh, call you and your attention to uh, the book of Exodus. One of the most exciting things about being uh, married to Tom is that we, we, it's almost as though the New Testament um, didn't really exist in the house, and we were always into the Old Testament stories. Um, I love the Old Testament stories because they give us so much wisdom uh, upon which we can borrow. Let me draw your attention to Exodus 3, and I think it, for us it, it really raises the challenge that I think God's people who are engaged in Christian community development uh, must address. The question is, what is Christian community development? What is, what is it about raising up housing, helping the homeless? What is it about putting together daycare centers or health centers that is unique to Christians? What does it mean to be a Christian community developer? And, and the question is, what is it that we bring to brokenness? Or is there, is there something special that we bring to alienation and division by the label Christian? The fact of the matter is we're not the first people who've been developing communities. So the question is, what is it that would commend us to people as Christian community developers? You know, the fact that somebody is in a bad news situation does not mean that the first person, the first person who shows up has good news. If I've been put out of my apartment, if the sheriff shows up, that's not good news because my stuff is going to go in the streets. If I have not been paid for three or four months and the next call I get is from the bank about my mortgage, that is not good news. So just because you show up in a community where there's bad news does not mean the people there believe that you got the good news. So the question is, what is it that makes us different when we call ourselves community developers who happen to be Christians? So you know the story of Moses. You know that Moses was, um, was very privileged in a lot of ways, and his life would be a candle that of many of us. He had been raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He had gone to what we would call a, a good school, gotten a good education, good background, but decided to go back home, as Johns Perkins would say, and make a difference. Now the problem that Moses got into as we move into chapter 3 of Exodus, is that he tries to do it without God. And so let me, let me call your attention now to what God is saying to us here in chapter 3. And I'm going to read the first 15 verses. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to, the, to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, I am here. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that, I, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of, our, of your fathers has sent you. And they ask me, oh, What is his name? Then what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Now, the issue here is, is just several things that I think God is teaching us. Um, one is that as much as we like to complain about how bad things are, I think Coach said it and John said it. We, we moan and groan as though we discovered the problem. We, we, like, we rattle off statistics about teen pregnancy and crime and black on black problems and white on white and white on black problems and Asian, Hispanic alienation, almost as though it's a rehearsal for something that's always going to be. The fact of the matter is God already knows the condition and does not need us to keep reminding him of it. In fact, the way the human brain works, every time you tell your brain something, you say, the floor is slippery. I don't want to fall. You will slip. Every time you tell yourself, it's dark in the room, I, I might be afraid. You really will be afraid. In other words, the, the brain doesn't know the difference between reality and illusion unless you instruct it. So by rehearsing over and over and over the condition, never talking about the God of the solutions, we give people the impression that there is nothing but the condition. God knows the condition. He says it himself. He says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out. And I know, he says, I am concerned about them. God already knows that. But another thing God knows, which really must wound and grieve the Holy Spirit, is that there are 84 million of us who say we have named the name of Jesus. You know, 84 million people ought to be kicking butt about something. I mean, 84, I can't imagine 84, peop, 84 million people in a stadium for a team not winning, I mean, at least scaring the other side by the noise that they would make. But 84 million people in agreement about anything is incredible. Not only that, 200 plus Christian bookstores, I mean Christian colleges, thousands and thousands of us every day engaged in ministries and parachurch organizations. 40 million of us watching Christian television every week. Not every month, every week. In other words, God knows what he's got. The question is, do we know? Do we know more than the condition? But God already knows the condition. He already knows that he's got the answers. And the question that God is raising to us is, have you gotten satisfied in Egypt? Have you invested so much in the problem? Have you invested in being the counselor to the poor? Have you invested in being the one who helps those who are homeless? Has this job gotten good to you? Or do you really see God as the answer? He knows the condition. He created the earth. It's his. 
the fullness therein, and they and all who dwell in it. He already knows that. He carved everything in the palm of his hand. He has every hair on our heads numbered. You think he knows the condition? So God already knows the condition. Two is that God cares. Many times when we show up, we think we're the only one who cares. God cares so much, he sent his son. He didn't send a check. He didn't send a plaque. He didn't send a letter of commendation. He sent his only son. That's how much he cares. And he said he cares so much that even when you and I were alienated, Christ died for us. So the issue is God's love, there's nothing that can surpass God's love. So no matter how bad the community is that you go in to develop, your care cannot ever surpass God's care. In fact, much of the time we act as though when we showed up, love showed up. When we showed up, hope showed up. When we showed up, wisdom showed up. God cares more than we could ever care about the situation. And what he's looking for is a people who are so invested in their love for him that all they take into the situation first is love. I've seen people come into the neighborhood who are going to help us, but who don't care for us. They don't especially even like us, but they're going to straighten us out and make us talk right, act right, walk right, but no love. So you've got a house built, but you don't care about the people in the house. You know, this is the first generation. I hate the term X generation, but this, because I, I think there is something known about people. But this is the first generation, the 20 something, who care more about the product than the people who sell it. We are not the first people showing up in broken situations who love. But for sure, if you don't show up with God's love, you can't do anything. You can tutor all day, you can mentor all day, you can build a house all day, but another one is broken down. You can fix this child and another one's broken. You can get one person out of jail and three are going in. If you don't have the love of God to compel you, you will not even stay in the situation. You'll be a drive-by community developer. And that's what we have. John Perkins stayed in Mendenhall. Vera May stayed there until the change came. Wayne Gordon and his wife Anne and their children stayed there. There were days I know that they wanted to leave and probably talk to each other loud about it. Why are you staying here when we're on our 12th television that we have been donating every time we go to the movies? But the fact is, without the love of God, you won't even hang in a situation. It took a long time for people to get hopeless, violent, disconnected, abused. It will take a long time to straighten it out. And if you think you're going to walk in with a PhD and a little education and straighten it out, it will not happen. Soon, it will not happen. But without the love of God, you won't have the staying power to hang in there. You will not have the power that transferred to people that they are more important than the project, that you care more about them than the stuff that you're fixing for them. So God cares, and he said that. He says in verse 7, he says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I heard them crying out, and I care. I'm concerned about them. So God cares, and unless you take his love, what gets translated is technical support but not love. It's love that changes people. It is love that changes hearts and minds. It's love that makes children want to get up out of the streets and come into church or come into the Bible study. It's that Vera May cared about them, that she knew their names, that their names mattered to her. They couldn't give her back anything, but they were important to her. When I was seven years old, I tell a story, um, and Wayne uses it a lot, that we were on welfare, and it was very tough. And my mother raised seven, eight of us by herself, and I was very distant from God, because I figured a, a God who couldn't produce breakfast really wasn't all that powerful. 
And so I became very hard in my heart about God. But I remember with girls getting pregnant all around us, 13, 14, long before it was popular, there was a librarian next door. In those days, when, it was, when there was no integration, librarians lived next door to welfare mothers. And so you could always see the possibility of what you could become. And I remember Miss Golightly, she would put on report card day, she knew she had no children, she was a spinster, but she knew from my mother when my report card came. And she would take my hand and open it like very gently and she would put a nickel in. And she would call my name and she said, Barbara, she said, you are very special. And this is a very special nickel. And you and this nickel are going places. And she said, you save it, and then you get another good report, and I'll give you another one. And pretty soon, you're going to be able to travel. And she planted in me such an esteem for myself and a desire to go places. It was incredible. If you don't bring that, you can't change your community. Three is that God appears. Now, what it says is that the people cried out, and here in verse 2, it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. God doesn't appear as in God come and he appears. He's already there. He is everywhere, in everything, all the time. He is omnipresent. In, in Psalms 139, it says, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the depths, you're there. Even if I go and run away to the bottom of the sea, you will find me. He's everywhere. It means that when, when people who are yielded up and broken and are no longer self-sufficient cry out, he appears. He makes himself visible. He was already there. But he appeared in the bush but he was already there. But remember, this problem did not start when Moses saw this burning bush. Moses had been 40 years in the wilderness. And for most of us, it takes, because our heads are like this, it takes that long for God to get our attention. I don't know about you, but I've had a, a serious wilderness experience this last year and a half. And there's some things about God did not cause Tom's death. But there are things that happen to us that God will use to get our attention. Moses, 40 years ago, went out, killed a man to straighten his situation out. He's articulate. He's fresh out of school. He's out from the palace. He's got all the answers. But 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years of just knocking your head against a stone wall. 40 years of stuff not turning over that quickly for you. He can't talk now. He's not as confident now. He is listening. He hears God now. And God appears to him. God does not appear to self-sufficient people. Do you ever realize that when 2 Chronicles 7:14? says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. It says, seek my face, but it also says, turn from their wicked ways. And I always wondered, what did God mean by his people being wicked? I mean, we don't lie all that much. You know, we don't steal anymore. We don't generally do drugs. What does God mean? Self-sufficiency. Pride in my reputation ability to get things done myself, dependence on myself, my access, my exposure, my ability to write, read, my skills, my gifts. In other words, as long as what we take into the community needing to be developed is that sense that I've got something that they ought to be proud that I'm here, nothing will ever happen through you or me. And God hates self-sufficient people. He says it himself. He says, I won't have any other gods before me. And guess who my God was? My God was my reputation. And my confession tonight is that my God was being married to one of the baddest expositors of the Bible in America. 
so much so that I sometimes didn't even care about going to church. I said, Tom, why don't you just talk this morning? Why don't you just talk a while? You know what I'm saying? I'll make you some pancakes and you just talk. <laughs> but whatever you depend on above God is called idolatry. God will not coexist with idolatry. Yes, God will use everything you are. He used Paul's ability to write, his ability to communicate, his tent-making ability now used to create new churches. He uses everything you are, but you can't depend on it. And later on, he will tell Moses to give me your staff. The staff here, I believe, in, in the fourth chapter of Exodus, it's what we need, what we'd rely on. You know, it's my pen, it's my laptop computer. It's my ability to put things together quickly. It's all of those things. God said, give it to me. He says, because it's a lot of snake in it. You give it to me. I can take it and I'll turn it around into something that'll save a people. But as long as you've got it and your name is on it and you have autographed it, I can't use it. So God will appear and he has the answer, but he doesn't have it except for empty vessels. Jesus said it better. He says, my father works to this very day and I too am working. In other words, Jesus says, because the father is working, I can heal, I can care, I can love, I can bind up the brokenhearted. Only because of the father working in me can I do these things. In John 5, 17, he says that. What he means is that if you are working, God is not working. As long as Barbara's working, God says, when you finish working, Barbara, call me, and then I'll be there. Because I am power. I am holy. I am righteous. You are not. And unless I see the blood of Jesus in you, yielded up to me, I can't use you. Yes, the community has needs, but I can't use a self-sufficient vessel. I can't use a strutting vessel. I want your book, Wayne, but I want you to give it to me now. So people who need hope in St. Louis and hope in Philadelphia can read it. Not that Wayne Gordon gets a pat on the back, but it's a model now for what can be used around the country in broken cities like Chicago. So God appears. He has the answer. And in essence, what God does, he... He appears, but he decides. Number four, he decides. First, he, he knows the problem. He already knows it. He cares about us more than we care. He appears to people who are yielded. But the fourth thing he does, he appears any old way he chooses. He said to Ezekiel, call the wind and I'll come forth and clean up this valley of dry bones. He says he'll come in any way he wants. He came as a baby in Bethlehem. He will appear anyway. My problem is that I'm, a, I'm an African-American professional woman, Tom Call, a professional colored lady. <laughs> and he said, so I want God to appear as a professional colored lady. I want a bad sister with the hands on her hips. You don't take no mess off of nobody, you know? Well, see, somebody else wants him to appear as a, as a white male in a suit. Presbyterian, preferably. <laughs> Somebody else wants a woman, a white woman. Somebody else wants an Asian. But God will appear in any old way he wants. John said it. Millions of people cried out about the conditions of the African-American community. Millions of us prayed and fasted about the state of our men. Women were tired of raising these children by themselves. What kept 65,000 black pastors from calling a million men together? God will use anything he wants. And he's known to use a jawbone of an, of an ass. And if the rocks have to cry out, they will cry out. I don't know about you, but I don't want the rocks crying out in my place. I don't want the rocks crying out in my place. So he'll appear any way he wants. You remember the story of Daniel. Daniel prayed for the children of Israel who were 
under siege. And you remember Daniel was fussing about it. He prayed for three weeks. And then the angel of the Lord showed up, and I know Daniel was a sister. He said, what took you so long? The angel of the Lord said, Daniel, the minion you prayed, that's why I came. I'm Gabriel. He said, but, but the enemy of God was opposing me, and because you prayed, I kept coming. See, we want to have one quick fix prayer and go on off and do all this work. Some things you can't do without laboring in prayer. So Daniel gave us an idea. He appeared to Jacob only after Jacob told him what his name was. What is your name? He said, Jacob said, liar. My name is Supplanter. I stole my brother's birthright. He says, great, Jacob, wonderful. Now that you told me your name, I can bless you. Some of us, our names are pride. Some of us, it is I'm committed to doing my thing, and maybe if somebody gets help, so be it. I'm really trying to empower myself, and I need this degree, and this degree requires that I do some urban work, see. I got to tell God. He says, fine, now that you've told me your name, your name is no longer Jacob, the liar. It is now Israel, the people of God. But God will not appear. He appeared to Esther, who I call the number one beauty queen in all creation. But until Esther decided to let go her title, put it on the line for her people, he did not appear. There was no deliverance. So God decides exactly how he will appear. Now the issue is, number five, is that God's answer doesn't begin with our service, contrary to popular opinion. See, we think because there's a problem, the, the answer is service. If you look back in verse 3, Moses said, I will go over and I will find out. He says, he says, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush is not burning up. In other words, he's saying, let me check this situation out. Let me go and see what I can do here in Lawndale, in Pittsburgh, in Philadelphia. He didn't say, let me pray first. He didn't say, this thing is so bad that I don't have enough resources. He said, let me go check it out. And that's what most of us, I do it. I said, let me see if I can fix it, because if hard work can do it, it'll get done, because I'm a hard worker. If access can do it, I can do it, because I know people in power. If skills, technical skills and computer skills can do it, I can do it, because I know how to run a computer. In other words, our first the answer, God's answer, comes, but only when service is superseded by worship. Let me say that again. In other words, the fact that somebody is in a bad news situation, poverty, AIDS, depression, homelessness, it's bigger than you. If your first answer to that is go check it out, you'll be consumed by the problem. See, it really wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the bush. God said, look, Moses, any old bush will do. It's me burning in it. I'm burning anything. It is when I learned, it was during the time that my husband was diagnosed with leukemia that I had two and a half months to take my ape type A personality and sit in an intensive care waiting room for two and a half months that God spoke to me about who he was. Now I'm one of those people who prays in the elevator on the way up and I consider that a long prayer. And I'm going, Phew, and I want water. God is calling us to worship and I hated prayer. I didn't want to pray. I didn't know what to pray, how long to pray, what was prayer. What, God knew everything. Why would I have to tell him? But God spoke to me, and he said, if you just understand who I am. See, Tom may not make it, but he'll make it because he's done what I have called him to do. But you're going to be out there in some stuff that's going to be really tough after he's gone. 
And you're not going to make it unless you develop a spirit of worship. And then I began to examine what the Bible says about the names of God. And I understood what Elohim means, the creator. I understood that Jehovah Jireh was the one who saw my every need and provided for it. That Jehovah Rapha was the one who sent his word and healed me. The cities that you are, have a burden for have already been healed. God is waiting for worshipers. He is the healer. We are not. We're simply instruments. I learned about Jehovah Roi, my shepherd, who provides my every need. Not my every want, my every need. 60% of my income left. When Tom died, and I have not wanted for anything. Because he is my shepherd. I knew Jehovah Nisi, who is my standard, my banner. And his banner over me is love. And when the enemy comes in, and trust me, if you haven't had the experience, he will come in. He holds up the standard, and he says, this far. And no, Father, this is my child. You can't touch her. When you start becoming a worshiper, everything around you will change. See, Moses' attitude is the same as ours. If you look at the bottom, at verse 11, he's, Moses says, but who am I that I should go? This is what you and I say. Well, I can't do anything about drugs. I can't deal with the AIDS problem. These kids are killing each other. They hate each other. They're just having babies. They're baby and violence machines. And we throw up our hands because Moses did not understand who he was serving. When we get an attitude that prayer is not about calling on Santa 365 days a year or the fire chief to put out crises in my life. See, God created us for worship, for fellowship, to love him and every neighbor as we love ourselves. Anything we do opposite that renders us powerless. Everything we do that is outside of the act of worship. It, I don't mean quiet time in the morning. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. To pray on the way to and from your job. In your car, in the shower, with your children, in church. Because the devil hates that you are even thinking about trying to heal or help somebody. Hates you. You ever see, think why there's so many defeated believers? Why we go around in a state of depression all the time? There's a war going on. What do you expect? You show up on Satan's territory decided, saying that you're going to take these kids who are destined for prison if nothing else happens in their life, and you're going to change that? And you expect the enemy to leave you alone? Get real. There's no day like that. It's not just some days. It may not be death of a loved one. It may be something else. It may be all your money all of a sudden dries up. Your friends leave. Whatever happens, the people reject you. But you are surely in a battle just being alive, and you are in a double battle going into the enemy's territory and declaring good news in a bad news situation. If you don't have a spirit of worship, the people have no hope. He inhabits our praises. See, prayer is really just talking to God. It's reminding God who he is. It's telling God, thanks for waking you up, giving you a place to stand. We whine. God hates murmuring. I believe the 40-year journey in the wilderness, which was 11 days, God added to it because they, they criticized Moses, the leaders. They didn't pray for them, and they murmured a lot. We whine all of the time. Every day, you get on the elevator. Say, how you doing? Well, I'm just barely making it. <laughs> Trusting Jesus. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't want none of that. If that's your trust in Jesus, give me something else. Instead of getting up and saying, another day to see God work. Another day to see healing going on. Another day of victory in Jesus. Another day for me to be hope in a hopeless situation. 
Another day for me to give people what good news there is. We say, I don't know, I'm just making it. Really? The king of glory has come into your life? The God eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, has invaded your person, your common clay of your person, and then all you're doing is making it? Then give me the alternative. And that's what the world is saying. If this is your Jesus, your division, your Sunday morning apartheid, your constant whining about the problem, you're never having a victory, then give me alternative. And the fastest growing religion today is Mormonism, Islam, and the New Age movement. No, we can say, but they don't have the answer. But we don't sound like we do. We don't act like we do. We don't model that. How will people know? Tom talked about the honk if you love Jesus banner on our cars. Is that how they know? Is this Bible big enough? No, people, I was led to Christ by someone who simply loved me. Who was there? Who said, I know a man who gave me hope, who can give you hope. Next is that God delivers us simply so that we can worship. So if you think that all God wants to do through you is build a health center, you've got another thought coming. God does not need you to build a health center in the inner city. He does not need you to mentor kids in the inner city. He does not need that. He delivers so, as he said to Moses, bring them to this mountain so they can worship me. What he wants is CCDA people all over the world who are worshipers first and out of their worship they serve out of their worship they love out of the worship they give out of the worship they care out of their worship they give hope we turn it the other way around we work and then if there's any time left maybe if there's nothing on TV if Oprah ain't saying nothing okay. y'all know what I'm talking about Five hours a week. That's what we do in television. That's why we are biblically illiterate. Why we cannot stand up to a Muslim and say, this is the reason for the hope that's in me. So God is looking for worshipers. God is bigger than the problem. We exist for one reason. And what God is asking us to do is not to go in and do the good thing. Go and do the God thing. The God thing is to say to people, I don't have the answer. I can't help the situation, but I know a man, and I belong to a man who can. I can do nothing of myself. Apart from him, I can do nothing. David said that. David was everything that you would not oh, give a person an award for be. He would not be my idea of a great man of God, but he said, search me, try me, see if there be any wicked ways in me. In other words, he said, I don't have it, but you do. Lead me to a rock. That's higher than I. That's the deer pants after the water brook. He says, my heart pants after you. God wants us to rush. You know how I got a heart for worship? I acknowledged that I hated to pray. I said, God, I don't know how. I don't know what to pray about. He said, well, just come sit with me. Just come talk to me. Just read the word. And after a while, if you get two hours is easy for me. Two hours in prayer in the morning. I pray. And it's not for myself. See, most of our prayers are powerless because we spend so much time on the gimme thing. Give me this, give me that, give me a wife, give me a husband, give me that, da, da, da. God said, look, you got it, but we still don't have no power in this city. I can give you everything you want, and the city will not change. What he wants are intercessory prayer people. When Tom was in the hospital, there was a group of women from Trinidad who came to me. And God sent them. I knew I was in a battle, but I didn't have the equipment. These women pray from Friday night at 10 o'clock until Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. And they don't play. They, they hold on. They grab hold to the throne of God, and they don't let it go till God answers. 
See, God exists to answer prayers because he answers his word. And I was telling somebody about a book that I want to commend to you. It's called Prayers That Availed Much. It's an intercessory prayer book created by a group of women who were travailing over a city, like your cities. And all they do is take every conceivable issue that you could pray about, depression, loneliness, broke, whatever, unhappy, take the scriptures, put it into a prayer. And when I didn't know what to pray, I prayed it. I would, leave, I would read it, and I would read it, and I'd read it. Before I knew it, I'd be weeping, I'd be praying, I'd be worshiping. In other words, there's no end of being creative about prayer. God is just saying, like he said to them, bring them up here. Bring the people out of poverty so they can worship me. Get them literate so they can worship me. Give them a house so they can worship me. Get them out of the gang so they can worship me. He has no lack of power to deliver. But God is saying, if you're working, I am not working. It's inconceivable to me that 80 million people could say they name the name of Jesus and this country be as sick as it is. And I would just close by simply reminding us that the purpose, again, of God's people is to worship. And you know, every time, if you look in the Bible, every single time God answered, there were people crying out. But they were not only crying out, they were interceding. And what were they interceding about? They were confessing the sins of all of the people. They were standing in the place of the wicked. See, we, what we do is we stand in a self-righteous position against Newt Gingrich, against this one, against that one. The fact of the matter is if Christ is not in somebody, what do you expect? So the issue is, I am not dealing with a personality, I'm dealing with a spirit, which I can only deal with in prayer. And so I would simply close by calling us to deal with the strongholds in our lives. All the things that we know stand in the way of God's answer and us. In other words, all power in heaven and earth has been given to us. He's already said that. Let's go teach in that power. He says, greater is he who is in us than he's in the world. So there's no problem bigger than God's people. So what's the problem? I suggest the problem is found in the book of Nehemiah. And I turn to that in closing it because Nehemiah basically did one thing when he found out that the walls were broken down in the first chapter. All he did is not go and gather his goods. He didn't go write a letter to Congress. He didn't go lobby. He didn't go and complain about the problem. He didn't call a conference or convention about it. Nehemiah simply got on his knees. He prayed. He wept for the city. And more than that, he told God that he was as responsible for the problems as the people who call them. And he said, he says, when I heard these things about the walls being broken down, I sat down and I wept. He says, for some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed. And before the God of heaven, and I said, oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. He reminded God of how big he was. Who keeps his covenant? God keeps his word. Tom used to say, God, the whole earth would have to blow up for God to lie. He keeps his word. He says, hey, you keep your covenant of love with those who love him and obey his command. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. He says, I confess the sins we Israelites not they who hate the poor, not they who hate blacks, not they who discriminate, not they who are into injustice, but we Israelites. We are one people. There's only one race. It's human. And there's only one color to God, and it's red. It's the blood of Jesus. He either sees the blood or he doesn't. 
But continuing, he says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. But he says, remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. We are a scattered people today. We are as disconnected as we could ever be. But he says, if you return to me and obey my commands, even if your exiled people are in the farthest horizons, if you are as alienated and separated as you can be as America is today, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God is calling us to intercede on behalf of America. But you know, God is more concerned about the state, the spiritual state of his people than he is about non-believers. And what he's calling us to do, and I want to ask you to join me in this tonight. I believe that Ezra and Nehemiah were no more powerful than John Perkins and Coach Gordon. You or me. But they did something that I want to ask us to do. I want us to just, all those who are not physically challenged, um, I want us to get on our knees for our nation. Because see, if we don't do this, then we can't expect the people who hate the poor, hate the disabled, hate the elderly, hate black people, hate Hispanics, hate Asians to do it. If we don't cry out for this nation and say, God, remember the promise you gave to your Abraham, and we are children of Abraham. So I want us right now to call out those strongholds, not in the lives of the, quote, oppressors, but in our own lives that keep God from answering. And I want to start with myself and my... I'm, I'm coming against right now. The Bible says that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, there's a binding and loosening power that God gives us. And right now, in the name of Jesus, in my own life, I bind the spirit of reputation. I've always been concerned about how looking okay to people. Not being offensive. I bind that. That's been a hindrance. And let's just call them out. Father, call them out. Pride. Call them out so God can hear us. Self-sufficiency. Jealousy. Envy. Fear, anger, racial animosity, prejudice, arrogance, unbelief. Oh God, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just come because we have no place else to go. We believe your word. We believe you sent your word to heal us. We believe your word will never come back void. And we come to you on behalf of this whole nation, God, and we confess that we have acted wickedly toward you. We have not believed your word. We don't believe you're big enough for the problems of our cities. God, we confess that. And we're sorry. We ask you to forgive us, God. You are the great I am. You are the Alpha and Omega. You are the everlasting God. You are the Prince of Peace. You sent your son and your word and you healed us. We are healed. Past tense, we're healed. And we claim that right now, God, in the name of Jesus. We ask you to lose your power, your healing power, your restoring power, your resurrection power. Father, you said that only your anointing would break these yokes. 
And right now we ask you to loose your anointing on all the CCDA members, God. Loose your anointing. Loose your power. Loose your healing. God, give them the strength to do the things in Jesus that they can't do alone. Oh, God, we see our cities whole. We visualize them healed. We visualize black people and white people and Asians and brown people, Native Americans, being together in a natural way, not an artificial way, but as family, God. Right now, we visualize the Acts 2 community. Oh, God, of people who have everything in common because they sit together and they pray together and they eat together and no one has a lack. Oh, God, there's no lack in you. Father, right now we come to you from every tribe and kindred and language and nation and we sing together the new song, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and worship and praise. We praise your name, God. We worship your majesty. Oh, God, you have been so good to us. Oh, God, we can't thank you enough for what you've done, even in this organization. We thank you for John Perkins and his vision. We thank you for Wayne Gordon. And we thank you for their families, God, for their staying power, that they cared, but you cared more. We praise you, God. And Father, we ask you to help us to forgive ourselves and to walk in the newness of light and let our language be seasoned with salt of your promises, not the problem. We recognize them, but we're not stuck there. We praise you now. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. We claim every promise right now for America. We thank you for every city that's represented here, every state that's represented here. Raise up leaders, God, indigenous leaders who will love you first, who will worship you. We thank you, God. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. In Jesus' name. And I just ask each person here. Uh,